This is the OGM check-in call for Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. Um, Grace is in a coffee shop uh, learning that, that getting a car and trying to get gas in near Eastern Europe is probably not going to go very well. So um, nice to see you. Grace coffee shop in what city? Uh, it's Medvoda near Slovenia, near uh, Ljubljana. But yeah, getting a car is really a huge challenge anywhere in the world these days. I don't think that's restricted where I am. Yeah, yeah. Petrol, petrol yeah. isn't a challenge yet, but <laughs> yeah, rent, rent, rental rates in Berkeley were up three to five times average rates about a month ago. Three to five times? You mean three to five x? No. Three to five x, hundred fifty dollars a day for a compact. It hurts. Oh, okay. And I'm used to paying like, you know, 30, 40, 50. Right. Yeah. And they had all sorts of bullshit reasons for it. Well, things like supply and demand, um, I guess. I don't know. Um, Pete, thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Here we are. So behind me, you see a collage made by our Pete Kaminsky, uh, or the world's Pete Kaminsky, who happens to um bless us with his his skills and so these are uh thumbnails of zoom calls from ogm over the ages and a couple other groups uh collected up and and collaged it's awesome so it's kind of like recursive i don't know we might i might get i might get sucked into one of the zoom windows and then then all bets are off that would be cool wouldn't that be cool that would be awesome you know zoom needs a couple special effects i've really wanted it from, Absolutely. From the beginning of lockdown, I've wished that Zoom had like a confetti drop for everybody. So you could hit like, like you could hit the magic buzzer and everybody in, in the Zoom would get a big confetti drop. That'd be kind of cool. But you could also have people like go into a vortex and like swirl down the toilet in the middle of, of their Zoom. Yeah. Well, you could also touch a piece of the wall behind you and pop into Jerry's brain for that call. Exactly. Or I could just yeah. touch, touch the edge of the wall here and then show up in Pete's in Pete's Zoom, because he happens to be next to me. It'd be cool to do like um, illusionist uh, tricks with Zoom. There's a couple of people on YouTube who've been doing like video illusions really well. Like they just keep getting better and the ante kept, keeps getting higher. So hi, everybody. Um, Good morning. We've, we've had a crazy week. Uh, how many days since the attack started? Eight. 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 You're in day eight. It's completely nuts. There is a Mattermost channel for emerging information about the Ukraine situation, which we should post to the chat. And, um, and let's go, um, Mark Carranza. Oh, we don't have both Marks on the call, but still, I'm so I'm habituated now. Uh, let's go, Mark Ken Bill for check ins for start. Um, good morning. Um, not much of a check-in, um, uh, kind of focusing on uh, mental health stuff. Um, the mental health, um, the San Francisco Mental Health Association has a Buried in Treasures um, course about collecting. And both my parents were uh, uh, hoarders and um, certainly at, at uh, times of stress and struggle, I might event some kind of Slight messiness around the house. <laughs> I've been to Mark's house. I can verify that. Really? <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, focus on what you can focus on. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, paying attention to the news a little bit. Um, really trying to pay attention to how to... Um, take um, digital things in the world and put them together into stories. So I wasn't able to uh, attend Tuesday or Wednesday um, for the uh, story threading. Um, and we take threads and we make them into a weave in some way. Um, but uh, also the uh, Frode Hegelin's Future of Text is working on this as well as is uh, you know, the Internet Archive uh, and uh, Bob Stein and uh, uh, 
Dan Weisel in Singapore working on uh, the notion of a tapestry. So um, slow going. Um, there's been uh, some advance and you know some UI putting stuff together, but putting stuff together doesn't make a story. So um, let's uh, let's keep working. Um, that's it for me. I will happily pass to uh, whoever Jerry said was next. Thanks, uh, Mark. Do you do you have any? Um, are there any kind of um, idealized or like really close to the Mark stories you've seen out there that are that are right now the, the ideals you hold up? Oh, dang. Um, so I have been involved in digital art for you know since 1983 or two, something like that, and. Um, you know, I've got this uh, wonderful book I mentioned Monday, Social Media, and uh, I think Edward Barrett um, from MIT has another book, The Society of Text. Um, but they're from 1994, which again is a little um, before uh, the web. And I know of wonderful art pieces. Um, especially done in uh, uh, Flash that basically go through and have music and text and, and have a presence. Um, but in terms of, you know, hypertext kind of stories, they've always left me kind of flat. Um, I'm working on, on something, but uh, one of the uh, wonderful things that the... Uh, um, Buried in Treasure's book talks about the uh, um, collecting behavior is I tend to collect projects that never get finished. <laughs> I can't empathize with that whatsoever. <laughs> and so one of those projects is taking uh, Borges's story or Borges's essay about John Wilkins, which talks about the Chinese encyclopedia. And you know, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you know about the Chinese encyclopedia. I can't come to mind with the um, exact classifications, but it classifies supposedly all animals into animals that um, belong to the emperor, animals that um, uh, sleep with their mother, animals that... Uh, you know, don't have any business being on television. It has this absolutely bizarre and wonderful miscellaneous classification system, which is the classification system of our minds. We do not have this natural Aristotelian classification ability um, that we use every day. And there's this wonderful book, Everything is Miscellaneous, by I think David Greenberg, if I got that correct. Uh, David Weinberger. David Weinberger, which basically makes that same argument that um, the metadata for Shakespeare could be King Lear. The metadata for King Lear could be Shakespeare, but it also could be, you know, the movie that was on 11 o'clock last night that I didn't, you know, fell asleep, you know, watching. So, um, Boy, Jerry, thanks. <laughs> great, great brain you have somewhere. <laughs> right in front of me. Um, and so it turns out that if you read the um, Borges's um, John Wilcombe's uh, article, that a number of the books that he talks about are actually in the Internet Archive, and they're absolutely wonderful and kind of nuts in the way that they describe. Once we get a universal language that everybody understands and everybody speaks together, the problems of humanity will be saved. Um, and um, right. there's, there's a famous, I'll try to make this quick, a famous um, a notion from that essay that some philosophers thought that Borges was telling the truth when he talked about this mythical Chinese encyclopedia. And um, uh, it was falsa erudition, false erudition that Borges often told in the tradition of Argentinian magical realism. And uh, it seems like a number of different people have had been fooled by that, um, different scholars. 
and the Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge is, <laughs> uh, was purported to be true, but that proportion is fake fiction. And I'll pass. Love that. Thank you. And, and this idea of a unifying language, or there's a very funny uh, one act play called, oh, I'll find it anyway, they propose a, a language called Unamunda. In fact, the play is really cute. There, uh, a woman shows up looking to learn Unamunda because she thinks there's a class going on at that time. And uh, it goes on from there. And Una, una Munda being sort of one world, uh, like Esperanto, it's sort of a joke on, on Esperanto or whatever else. Um, oh, let's go back to, uh, we had Ken, Bill, Grace. Ken, you are muted locally. Hello, everybody. So much better. Yes, um, I forget that I have this little thing. And actually, the, the cord in my computer lights up, lights up red when that's on, but I wasn't looking at that. So, um, you know, I think the most common words on Zoom are you're muted. So uh, just carrying on the tradition here. Um, Pete, thanks for doing such an amazing job with the, the Plex newsletter. Um, just really, you know, I don't, I get so many newsletters, I unsubscribe all the time, but I read this one. So, um, you know, you should, that's high praise, you know, it's, a, <laughs> um, and thanks everybody for your contributions. It's really a pleasure to see folks in there. I feel like it's a really important um, community organ, you know, it, it helps bring us together and see different sides of, of each other. So I just wanted to give some, you know, acknowledgement and appreciation for that. Uh, what am I up to? Um, I'm trying to take um, the six months worth of inclusion dialogues work that I did for this big company and turn it into a series of blog posts. And I have to be really careful because I can't disclose anything, you know, that might link back to the company. But I've been thinking about it. It's been three months since I wrapped. And, um, you know, it really had a very deep effect on me to talk. I, I've calculated I talked to 970 people, um, 392 of them were women, 364 were people of color, about 380 were from countries other than the US. And to have the opportunity to be in conversation with so many people about what does, what's it like to hear stories of non-inclusion and um, have your experience validated. So I do have a short story here, since you asked in the chat a little while ago, I may have an example of the story. This was heartbreaking. Um, really nice guy on the call said you know i am a physically large black man and i live in atlanta and everyone in the office was given hoodies with the company logo on them i can't wear mine because a physically large black man in a hoodie is both a target and a threat and i also have to come to work and be super calm and nice and grounded even if i've been pulled over for driving while black i honestly don't think white people have a clue what black people have to put up with every day. And it just hit me in the gut, you know? Um, there was something about listening to stories like that over and over, hearing from women especially, the, the amount of racism in the company is pretty minimal. And it's mostly covert, it's a few bad apples here and there, but the sexism is just rampant. And um, to listen to so many women just sharing their outrage and their disappointment and their frustration. Um, something I'm sure everyone on this call will relate to is how often I heard, you know, if women speak up and are assertive and um, confident, they're labeled as bitchy or on the rag. But if men do it, they're great leaders. And, you know, so what are we going to do about the double standard? Or I'm an articulate person and I really take time to carefully, you know, construct my sentences. And I think I do a good job of communicating, but I have male colleagues who insist on mansplaining what I just said. What the fuck is up with that? So gentlemen, we have a lot of work to do. Um, I, I really hope that um, our generation can do some mentoring for the younger generations and help them along um, because it's just, when you sit and hear this month after month, week after week, day after day, you know, for months, it really starts to to hit you of just how poorly, how poor a job we've done in creating an inclusive workplace. In create, in, and I kept thinking of Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech. We're attempting to create a workplace where people are judged on the, the competence that they bring to work and on their character and their ability to, you know, create a, a great place. Um, and, uh, 
And so it feels like a democratization and a, a fulfillment of a, of a long promised something that has not come to fruition. So I felt really honored to be part of this. And I'm just trying to figure out how I can put this into a series of blog posts that'll have some impact for folks. That's what I'm working on right now. Thank you Thanks. for listening. Thanks, Ken. And it feels like this is an issue that was swept under the rug or kept behind the curtain or, or like shuttered in the attic for years and years and years. And now at least it's, it's in conversation, but that only helps us realize how pervasive it is and how difficult the behaviors and beliefs and biases are to flush or to, to try to improve. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a big, it's, it's a, it's a, tough thing you know i mean there's an awful lot of inertia in the system and a lot of resistance to to making this happen so um you know the number one thing i heard is i love the fact that we're talking about inclusion but i'm not going to speak up to my boss or my boss's boss until i know it's safe to do so so management has to model this management has to show me that you know if if i see a managing director do something that's not inclusive i want somebody else to call them out on the spot another managing director and say hey that's not cool that's not aligned with our, our aims here i see enough of that i'll start to speak up until then i'm just along for the ride which is a very human thing and you know i really hope this company has the the sense to follow this up with okay we've made a really great start now we have to keep pushing because if there's nothing else coming along it's going to be flavor of the month and people are going to feel jerked around and it's like okay well we did that we checked the box on inclusion and now we're on to the next thing and nothing has changed and what a waste that will be of all the time and effort and money that was poured into this and all the hopes that were stirred up totally agree thank you uh Gil and judy and thank you for that i'm i'm <clears throat> I'm very moved by what you've done and what you've shared and how you've shared it and how this is showing up for you. So thank you very much for that. Um, I look forward to the blog post, but I think you've got something, a, a bigger tiger by the tail here. And I don't know if it's a book or if it's a media platform or a TV series or what. Um, I'm, you know, I, can, I can envision a book that is completely anonymized, but that tells this story uh, with the depth that you obviously have available to tell it. So for what that's worth. Um, thank you very much for opening this. Um, two questions for you. Um, one is I'm surprised that you said that um, in contrast to sexism, that racism seems very rare in this country because at least from the you know, toxic media feeds that I see, it feels rampant and really deep and ugly uh, and hard to shake. So I'd like to, you know, if you can give me a different perspective on that, that would be great. That company, uh, not country. Company. Important distinction. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. that helps. Um, more importantly, you said you've been profoundly affected by this work. I'd love to hear either now or another time a little bit more about how it has affected you personally. What what has what has it provoked in you? What is shifting in you as a result of this experience? Because it's it's rare and very valuable what you've been through. I could respond in the moment or I can let other people go. What do you want to do? Um, why don't you go ahead um, a, a moment, go for it. That's what this is about. So it's really sensitized me to, um, especially the sexism, when I see it in the media or around me in conversations. Um, you know, I have, I, I'm, I'm a senior citizen almost i'm getting up there you know and i have uh these these men in my life who send me these jokes on the you know in mail like it's not funny you know uh, stop sending this this is this is racist this is sexist this is not funny so i'm having these conversations with some of my older male friends and they're like come on it's just a joke i'm like that's the whole point you know this understanding of it's not just a joke you're carrying forward a little bit of hatred in the world you're you're adding to the amount of ignorance and hatred and you're better than that so that's been an interesting conversation with a couple of my male friends um and um just it's made my heart softer you know i i'm i'm just so attuned to how much more suffering there is than I was aware of. And I was already pretty aware of a lot of suffering. So trying to be kinder and nicer to people and not to, you know, to take responsibility for myself and not add to hatred and not add to ignorance. And, and just, you know, when I see somebody struggling of like, okay, that's a person struggling. What can I do? How can I, how can I be of supporter service in this right now? So I think that's, that's another piece of it is just, I don't want to continue to be part of the problem. 
Thanks, Ken. Uh, Judy, then Wendy. I was just going to comment on, on how we connect facts and factoids and things, because there was an article done by a guy from my MIT a number of years ago who talked about how we file things in our brain is related to all of our past experiences. And our brain finds similar things to connect it to, which might not be what we would consciously choose. <laughs> so it's sort of like the input that we receive is in the context of what we've previously received. And they did a test on this where they, they told a story or showed a video clip of a, a gentleman talking to a woman across the room, a married man, and how the subjects interpreted that differed if they thought that the guy had a great relationship with his wife or the guy had been playing around. And they filed it differently in a different section of the brain physiologically when they could look at mapping the electrical impulses and where they went, it went a different place. So the question of how we would address content appropriately to be received and how to attempt to influence that requires that we try to develop a deeper understanding of the existing framework of the individuals with whom we're talking because it's gonna get filed according to their experience, not how we intend it to be taken in based on what we say. And I don't know how to do that, but I think it would be an important thing for us to consider. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Wendy? Okay, so I'm gonna try and articulate something. I'm not sure if I'll be successful, but that is um, exactly the point I wanna make, actually. I think. A lot of times um, in spaces where I am, well, first of all, Ken, thank you for bringing this up. Like, I think it's, an, it's a very interesting point to talk about in a community like this one. Part of the reason why I enjoy coming to this community is because I feel like everyone who comes is of open heart and open mind. And hence the name, of course. <laughs> but I just realized I made that pun. Um, so um, Basically, I, I, so I'm going to try and be vulnerable here and kind of share that I think oftentimes when I am speaking with just other women, the conversation is very cyclical and more emergent, I would say, but I'm trying to describe something I've never thought about before. So I might not quite have it down when I'm talking with a room full of men and I'm one of the few women in the room, the conversation is more um, linear. It's um, more results oriented. It's more um, hierarchical in ways where people are, before they speak, I think people are thinking about the objectives. Women before they speak potentially, and I'm oh, just way over generalizing. I'm just trying to point out some differences are speaking more to understand connection and relationship. So that when I am speaking, when I tend to speak to those kinds of things in a room full of men, because our society narrative is more based along the lines of, puts those two different types of conversations in, this is a good kind of conversation, and this is a soft, weaker kind of conversation, that when the conversation needs to, and, and, and I, I wanna say that clearly, needs to go in a space of emergence and connection, it is often ignored, right? By the conversation that's happening around uh, conclusion and direction and, 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 um, and action. So I think in truth, both are needed. And it's really the narrative that's in our head that tells us that one is better than the other, um, no matter what our background or what our gender. Um, and so I think uh, it's, lo it's lost and I, and even sometimes in, I'll be frank, and sometimes in, com in these conversations, I either don't speak up because the conversation isn't circular right now and I'm having a circular kind of thought or connecting kind of thought, it doesn't quite fit. So it's no one's fault. I just don't feel it's a, the right moment to say something or because when I start to express something, um, the idea is lost a little bit because the conversation moves very quickly back into an action-oriented conversation and we, and we don't spend time further exploring what connection was trying to emerge through my voice or through some other people's voices because that's a different kind of conversation to have. So 
sometimes I'll, I'll just let it go. And sometimes I'll try and bring it back up, you know, three or four comments later to see if it can, it can breathe some life into it, into things. So anyway, that's my, that's my perspective. Wendy, thank you. That's um, like super interesting in so many different ways. Uh, I posted in the chat that years ago, I read Deborah Tannen's book, You Just Don't Understand, which um, has some broad generalizations about how men and women communicate. But one of the things that stuck in my head immediately, you only need to read the first chapter because all the other chapters play it out in different scenarios. But the thesis is right up front. And she just says, women negotiate intimacy in a community, men negotiate status in a hierarchy which means uh, if Pete broke his leg, I'll come up and say, ah, that's nothing. I shattered my leg in eight places and then like had a lion's claw up my side. It's like, I had a worse injury than you. And women will say, oh my gosh, that must hurt. Um, I hurt, I, I, you know, I, ha I had a pain like that recently too. Um, and it's a generalization, but I found over and over again that it applies. Second thing, and then I'd love to see what other people think, like Ken just raised his hand. Um, I like to think that these conversations have a circularity and an eddying sort of feature to them. And I'm I, I, like, my ears pricked up a lot because I'm like, okay, how much am I behaving like a dude trying to drive toward results here? And how much is this a, a sort of a juicy emergent conversation? And I'm actually in kind of aiming for emergence. And I'm, many calls back, I said, my MO here in the check-in format is I, I, I dip my ladle in the stream of what everybody's doing. And then when something interesting shows up, I stir a little bit and I'm like, well, how about this? And what do you think? And that's kind of the, 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 the method with an intention to see what, what shows up and what anybody else wants to throw in. But then we whip on through things pretty quickly. And we're, we're kind of on a drive to make sure most everybody gets to check in during the call, which is, which is kind of the, the urgency of, of, well, we can't dwell on that for too long. And the five interesting things we've turned over so far would each be like great subjects for a deeper call, right? For, for spending some time. So, so I'm, uh, other thoughts, Ken, 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 then Judy. Yeah, I just thank you, Wendy. There's something here that ties to collective intelligence for me. Um, when they were first studying collective intelligence at MIT, Thomas Sloan wrote this paper and said there's three conditions that evoke collective intelligence in groups. And the first is social perceptiveness. It's being aware of your impact on other people. And the second is turn-taking, ensuring that everybody has an opportunity to speak. And the third is adding women to the group. And women, in my experience, tend to be much better at the first two. They tend to be much more attuned to how they're impacting other people, and men are kind of oblivious often. Um, this is a generalization. I'm sure there's men on this call who are already exceptions to those, the, that rule, but, you know, um, and women also, I hang out with a lot of women in my life, you know, and I've been in the only room in many conversations, and I've noticed that women are really good at allowing other people to speak and just waiting and holding back and, you know, listening, and, and men jump in all the time. So... Um, Okay. Gil, can you mute? Um, Sorry, guys. Uh, Thought it was. And so when, I, when I'm listening to Wendy talk, I'm, I'm thinking this is directly related to collective intelligence. If we're going to become collectively intelligent and really bring out the best in each other, we need that circularity. We need that how am I impacting other people? Am I, am I being a bull in a china shop? as somebody just was in this community and, and did that, you know? Um, I think these are really, really important aspects of our collective behavior that we don't pay enough attention to. And we don't have a lot of um, good coping mechanisms for when those kinds of things show up, um, which is why we need collective agreements in place before they show up. Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Judy Stewart, Wendy. Um, one quick comment and one thought. I wanted to reference an old book written in the 80s called Women's Reality by Ann Wilson Schaaf, which was at the time absolutely the only and best source of the differences in the way women think and behave from men at the time. Um, it was a really insightful group, well embraced by the women in science group that I was part of because we were always outnumbered 10 to one in any particular situation and conscious thinking of how to introduce the perspective into the group was part of the discussion in the women's group for how we would cope in, let's say, a corporate environment. I think also that this is extremely important if we think about how information is gathered and communicated and by whom and the context in which they present what is supposed to be factual information. 
And that's something that we could spend more time studying or thinking about because it's a combination of, of how you understand and learn and what you learn from every interaction or exchange you have, whether it's with a person or a book or whatever. And if, the, if we want to create the sort of generative process that we've talked about from the accumulated wisdom of indigenous species and other people of different orientations, we need to move this from the unconscious level to the conscious level in what we're doing. Do you mean move from two or do you mean blend and integrate? I think, and this is that's a squishy that's question a, anyway. Well, I, I'm, I think we want the end result to be to blend and integrate, but I think sometimes you actually have to consciously operate in the zone that can be heard with the group rather than in the zone you would prefer to operate. And do you mind giving us a tiny bit of background? You were really early into like um, science and stuff in a men's world. Um, you have a lot of, of, of experiences there. Uh, just, a, just a little, maybe a taste of your experiences. Oh, wow. Well, that's certainly true. Um, I've heard typical, some of your stories over time. Yeah, one, one point I'd make as an, an, an extreme example, there weren't very many women in science as an undergrad. Um, and there were even fewer in chemistry than there had been in biology, which is where I started. Um, when I came to 3M as a technical employee with a fresh PhD, there were precisely 14 women in a campus of multi-thousands that were technical women in the technical community. And there was only one woman at an executive equivalent level. Um, and she had been there 20 years. And she said that it was clear to her very quickly that she wouldn't be able to move up in the traditional fashion in the organization. So she moved into information management and became senior VP for all of the information management at a high tech, very information oriented company. So she did have a lot of influence, but it was limited. Um, so I think I was keenly aware that I was always the only woman in the room, unless once there was an operating committee when I'd gotten to a higher level and the HR representative from the HR department to our division was a woman. But it was a, it was a rarefied atmosphere there were funny jokes. I've talked about writing a book about some of it. Um, <clears throat> typical sexist behavior that you'd expect to see in a bar sometimes happened in business settings. Um, it differed with different countries that you participated with. Um, oh, an interesting why statement was when I was being considered for a position in Japan, which would have been pretty unprecedented in the, I guess it would have been the early 90s. Um, I got some feedback from the Japanese that, you know, if that had happened, the Japanese knew that if the person that was sent to Japan was a woman, it would be an exceptional person because that's what 3M would do. Wow. <laughs> but it's just, it's changed a lot, but it hasn't changed in its root values because the experiences we all have are still perpetuated by the roles we have experienced in our family and in school and other places. And so I think one way to deal with it perhaps is to personalize and say, in my experience or when this happened to me and so forth, almost always that diffuses the combative tendency. For instance, if you're saying this to a person at the podium and you're disagreeing. Um, but in one instance, I did hear a person respond um, and it wasn't to me, it was to a man who had actually said something similar he said, that's right, and you're just wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's a very pervasive underpinning. One of my colleagues from New Science Associates, where I worked long ago, Nina Buck, um, is, was born in Nanital in India and wound up license, working for MIT, licensing their, their IP, and she would travel to India, and the, the other people in the room would talk to her junior male uh, um, partner in the room and just wouldn't deal with her. Uh, and this is not that many years ago, let's say 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And I was like, good God. Um, Stuart, then Wendy. 
it's just kind of amazing to me that um, that we're still talking about this in some ways. I was just thinking about what it is I wanted to say. And it's kind of like, um, you know, very often I, I, I work with my head down working on my own creative projects. And then, you know, periodically uh, I'll do a client project or I'll open my eyes and, and, and go out into the world and it's going, holy shit, I can't believe that, that they're still in these conversations. It's just kind of, you know, extraordinary to me. Um, and, and I think the answer is a quote from Viktor Frankl. Uh, between stimulus, stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Uh, it's about being aware of the unconscious bias, the implicit bias that's buried in everybody, and it's time to just stop it. Um, some of it, I think, is in the biology. And I don't know if Umberto Maturana would have something to say about this. You know, he talked about the capacity of humans to caress as a loving, compassionate expression. But the, the, the other piece is, you know, guys are still lobbing projectiles all over the world. I mean, we are seeing it in Ukraine now. It's just rampant and wild. And it's kind of, you know, for years I've known that the salvation of planet Earth is going to have to do with... Um, men realizing that they're wrecking balls in some ways and that women need to um, start really stepping up and we need to be creating um, much greater partnerships because um, that balance is, 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 is where the, um, the salvation of humanity may lie. Dory, one day then Grace. Yeah, thanks Stuart for that. I, I, um... I agree, and and I'm just going to shift um, the framing just a little bit for for the point I'm going to make in turn in talking about not just women and men as gender, but women the energy, you know, like a female energy and a male energy, um, because I think different genders can also carry the opposite as well. So I'm just putting that out there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use those terms going forward. I think the male energy has dominated our culture for so long now, and I think truly a balance is really what's required. And what we're seeing is when one dominates, you know, when one energy dominates too much, it happens to be the male energy and it happens to have been for the last couple hundred years, if not longer, um, and or probably a lot longer. Um, and so we are way out of balance in balancing those energies. So to me, when we think about what the solutions are, um, it's first in recognizing that the energy is completely out of balance, that it's not about the female energy coming over to where the male energy is and, and meeting it there. It's about the male energy working to decrease itself, if that can be a thing, while the female energy is, it takes up the void. Because this idea that, that women will step <clears throat> forward and somehow, and somehow dominate the moment is using a male energy. So it's not gonna happen that way, in my opinion. It's gonna happen by the male energy recognizing that it needs to step out of the way. And what does that look like? That looks like being humble. That looks like um, being silent. That looks like listening deeper. That looks like asking more questions. That looks like uh, repeating what a, what a, what's, what's emerging over and over and over again until it makes more sense. Um, just all those kinds of things that don't have to be in words that feel female to people, they don't, and as gender, they don't have to um, be uncomfortable. It just has to make an effort to, to, to balance itself, right? So um, I think there are times still, and will continue to be times where that male energy, we need to get things done. We need to stick it against the wall. We need to do it yesterday. We have an emergency, all those kinds of things will definitely still need to be there. Um, and at the same time, if we're going to learn it all from, say, the, our own chemistry, our own biology, our own humanity, we're actually in healing, nurturing mode, or should be, we're not, should be in healing, nurturing mode, something like 75% of the time, our internal chemistry, right, or even more. And I, I played around with the thoughts that actually maybe the energy balance isn't even 50-50, true energy balance would actually be more in the realm of like 75, 80% that female nurturing, supporting, 
collaborative energy. And only every now and then when absolutely necessary, do we need to fight flight action, like super action oriented, very electric, very quick. So just thought it through it. So in that sense, we're way out of balance. <laughs> just before going to everybody else in the queue, I just want to share this spot in my brain, which is we've been suffering from a young overdose for 300 to 3000 years where I've collected a whole bunch of stuff. I have a little video that I've shared here before called why I do what I do, which says that, that we are in a moment right now of rebalancing that we're, we're in this lovely, crazy, wonderful moment right now where, where we are rebalancing yin and yang. And we're, if the, the more we can figure out how to come back in uh, into community and, and, and so forth, I'll share that particular link in the, in the chat right now, uh, that a link directly to that thought. Um, but that's, I think that's our work. That's a, a big piece of our work is to, to figure out that rebalancing. Um, Wendy, thank you for the reframing and the, the great ideas poured back in. Uh, Grace, then Allison. So yeah, so my frame is a little bit different. And I think this is a very, very OGME type of problem because it's a systemic issue. I mean, if you imagine that um, a bunch of kids are playing outside and they and they create a game, right? And they create this great game and it's really fun for kids and they're good at it. And then as an adult, you have to go there and you have to play the game and uh, you have to put on kid's mind and, and you're not a kid. Like your brain is afraid of like jumping over that thing that looks a little scary and sharp and kids aren't even seeing that it's scary and sharp, but you could train your brain. You could train your brain a little bit, but actually there's a few things you have to climb through that you're physiologically, you, you just can't. Right. And that's, you know, that's the system, right? Women are operating in the system and you know, and everybody's operating in a system that was created by a few Western men. And so we can adjust ourselves to it, and, but there's physiologically, it's never gonna fit. And so these are really deeper systemic things. And a lot of times I find that the conversation feels like we're gonna fix it by, you know, training men to have a different mindset or being aware of it, or we're gonna, but it's actually like, there's things about what it means to win the game in today's world that simply, you know, so, so, you know, when Ken was talking about these, you know, the way that the corporate environment works, even the game of playing winning in the corporate environment is, you know, it, it's a certain kind of game that maybe you're not so interested in. And Judith was talking about 3M, which is one of those corporations that had double tracks, right? One track was a scientific, you could, you know, you didn't have to become a beer manager to get a higher rank. And, and I think there's something like that, right? And in women's societies, like the rank thing is a little weird, like, Ooh, I'm a better mom than you are. I had five kids. How many did you have? You know, like it's just a stupid, stupid thing to say. And mine is a doctor and yours is a lawyer. And right? like, it's just not a winning. It's not the kind of game you can win. It's just the game you, you know, it's like you're playing a game without keeping score or something. Or, I mean, we are keeping score. We know who's the better mom, but you know, anyhow. So, so like these systemic things, it's almost like I almost never want to talk about the sexism issue because it's, it's not going to be solved by by like looking at the problem as it surfaces right it's like it's like if i'm getting hives from something i eat and i'm like well maybe i should put some salve on the hives that's kind of how it feels to me that's complete um thank you grace allison yeah thank you i didn't realize i was already unmuted um Agree, agree with both of their shares and, and Wendy, thank you for that contribution. And I have the experience of being able to sit in a one-on-one -on -one call with Wendy. And it was, it was really um, impactful in understanding that we showed up for the call. And I think that the energetics that Wendy brings is I'm here for the purpose of connection and being in service. And that alone right there, done, that's it. For me, and that that speaks to being a feminine quality, but I think that we have become in an achievement. What is the purpose of when we're coming into a connection, and when we and we're able to state our purpose and our function, then the energies that we're acting upon within those are um, are are available and in whatever humble way that we can continue to check in. Is my purpose being met? And connection right now, I think couldn't be and service they, they couldn't be more important 
in terms of a purpose. Um, <clears throat> that's what we're going for as we feminize an economy and understand that what an economy truly is, is a relational conversation. It's a conversation of needs and wants. I spent about an hour and a half yesterday in a nonviolent communication with a man talking about his, his need you know, it was an hour and a half of a group of people just inquiring about what his possible needs were and the other person in the conversation. And it was amazing how <clears throat> it's like watching Greek theater in some ways. We really are getting closer to our own needs when we're playing these roles and responsibilities and acknowledging the different aspects of ourselves that are coming up and how we share those and oftentimes what happens with male, female dynamic or whatever conversational dynamic is a lot of um, assumption and, and personalizing. And so those things come up. Another thing that came up was just that this uh, thing of 70%, what you know, we were talking about of the nurturing and that just, that's, that's resilience, right? And then it's a little bit, we gotta respond to, to fear. So I really like that energetically. Um, that speaks to salutogenesis, right? Now we need our resilience and we need a purpose and we need to know that we have a little bit of security and stake in the future. And, um, and the, the function of coming in and dominating anything in order to prove one's merit or one's worth as we have now is, um, is not in service of like the wampum belt, which is communicating our connection and the fact that when we come together, we're, we're better for it. And, and so how do we construct arrangements on the, con and the social conversational level that bespeak what a wampum belt is communicating and um, rather, rather than the transaction or the commodity behind it. Um, and this, this I've, this I've noticed for a long time, you know, the, the ramping up of the STEM conversation and education and let's get more women in math, engineering and technology. And, and that's, that's great. And we, we're talking about it from this place of equity, but we haven't really looked at the purpose behind it. And so in the process, all of women's work is now not considered. We're not talking about increasing wages for teachers or social servants in any way. Um, we're just talking about increasing really our competitiveness on a global economic marketplace, right? So get more people in there because um, the United States is gaining, is losing traction. So coming into something and maybe recognizing within our conversations on some level, what our purpose is, and could it really ultimately be anything other than connection and, and service to the other person needs? Thank you, Allison. I, just, uh, I forgot I one thing I wanted to say on the physiological level, and that that's like, I don't really want men to stop lobbing certain kinds of trajectories around. Like men should still get to be men in constructive and useful ways. So I, I really don't see any problem with that. Like I find it kind of attractive just so you, you know, like, but it has to be in a certain context. I love that, Grace. And Grace, do you want to jump in before your bus or do you have to run catch your bus right now? Because I, I have think to I can run now and then, yeah. Well, then go. So I'm, I'm, thank you. I've got, uh, Bill, Grace, uh, Eric, Pete, but Grace will just slide you in whenever you raise your hand and say that you're good to good to talk. So, um, Bill, the floor is yours. Well, hi everybody. So now I feel a lot better than I have been feeling for a week. I have to tell you, it's really I've been having a very difficult time just focusing on anything but the daily requirements. Very difficult. And, uh, but one thing that Allison just said strikes something I've been reading. I'm going to moon again about uh, Amitabh Ghost, The Great Derangement, which I'm now reading for the second time and likely will read a third time. But it's just something that's come up that I've been getting tired of hearing all this talk about, oh, we must achieve this. We have to go through this. We have to prove this. I'm like, what are we doing? What? are we doing? I mean, I'm older now. I'm like, sorry, I'm done with proving. <laughs> I, I really am, you know? And uh, 
So I think there's something that at least I'm working on trying to re-examine exactly what is the way that I actually see myself and each other in the world when we try and accomplish things. And I guess I'm getting really a little tired of some of the, I don't even know what to say. It kind of, everything you see, a lot of what is talked about and like, here's the, you know, to be strong. It's so, everything sounds like a cliche. I'm like, like, could I just sit here and be like terrified? Because I think that's actually how I feel. Um, and so, I mean, this actually I feel better now after this last hour, but, uh, so I don't really have much else to add, except that this is where I'm trying to explore and, uh, you know, just get away from trying to make simple generalizations about the situation that we're in, because it's not simple. It just is anything but simple. And well, so the the other example. So I felt like you know, in addition to the all the fighting in in Ukraine, right? I mean, the next day the UN publishes this. You know, the IPCC publishes this blaster of a report, and like. How, I just, I am so, just astounded when I hear the news, like, why is not, not in every news story, why are we not talking about this? Like, it's not going to go away. I mean, I'm a, you know, thermodynamicist, so I'm sorry, the second law of thermodynamics is not, you know, there's no litigation here. <laughs> um, so I'm just, this is kind of like, I'm like, whew. So, you know, I'm sitting on the floor here with uh, doing the best I can. But thanks, y'all. It's been very encouraging. Um, Bill, thank you. Let's, let's just go into silence for a little bit. You brought us into a different place, and I appreciate your saying what you just said very much. I think, I think what you were talking about really is what we're all trying to figure out how to cope with. It's like we, we give, I think most people in this community give a big damn about the big issues that we're talking about, which is partly why we keep going back to them on these calls and keep turning them over and keep trying to figure out how to solve them and what our role is and how to make all those things kind of work so that we can tip things toward a better world. And it's really hard. It's just really hard. And I don't think we acknowledge the difficulty and the pain and, and we don't accept just being in, in that grief very often. We're busy like, like little hamsters on the, in the habit trail trying to figure out how to make things better and what our role is and what to, you know, how, how do we get more solar panels installed or whatever it might be, right? So thank you. Um, anyone else who would like to um, offer something in the spirit of Bill's comments. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. Just just briefly, the, the, the piece that's so frustrating is we seem to know what to do. <laughs> we seem, you know, not everyone, but, but most people who are on this call, if given the opportunity to, <laughs> to be in charge of the world, would know the action, know what to do, could make a plan. Just make us <laughs> emperors. I mean, heck, that, does that, is that so hard? Are we asking for that much? And, and, and people just go along on their, on their, on their, on their rat wheel. Um, I, I, um, now I can't remember his name right now. At Stanford, the epi, um, um, 
epidemiologist. Epi, epi, epigeneticist. Epigeneticist. Uh, yeah. Um, just talking about how we're so controlled by old programming um, and that we can't get beyond that, that old programming. And that's where we are, I think, as a species right now, um, taking that, 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 next, that next step because the programming we grew up with is not going to get us to the world uh, that needs something new right now today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, George. Um, we have Eric, Pete, Judy. Yeah, hello, everybody. So I'm going to share a link in the chat, but it's not what I want to talk about. It's an interesting app that's in beta testing. So um, oh, let me enter. OK. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I visited my parents this past weekend, and they have Netflix, and I finally got around to watching the Don't Look Up movie, and I was just surprised at the emotional impact it had on me for the next day or two. Um, yeah, really. I mean, just that's holding up a mirror to the world that we're living in now, and where do we fall, and uh, where would we be when that uh, tidal wave comes? <laughs> so, um, now, I'm going to show you two books on my nightstand, and uh, like it's partially related to our topic and also like the theme of Black History Month. Uh, this is Hidden Figures, the book from the movie of the three women who worked at NASA. And this is one that uh, about a guy who worked in the early days of the video game. Um, yeah, he, one of the first American African engineers to work in the design of video games and the imagination machine personal computer. Now, uh, there's a museum that I, holds an event that I participate in each year, uh, Vintage Computers. And this year's themes are women in computing and computers for the masses. So like my initial reaction to those themes was like, why is it necessary to call out specific groups like women? Well, there really is a problem uh, that we're trying to address. So fine, okay. Well, you know, well, uh, that hidden figures, I mean, these are, these books are about people who really achieved. And like, there's another thing that I wanna mention that uh, a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness, spelled with a Y, H-A-P-P-Y-ness, yeah about Christopher Gardner, who um, overcame enormous struggles in life. So I guess that's the model that we see, that uh, we want minorities to really struggle and work, work within our system. And, uh, but I could see they, there are resistance to that too, but then where's the balance between like government assistance and personal ownership of your life and career and uh, working your way out of problems versus becoming uh, a slave to debt or whatever else. It, so th these things can just toss around my mind as I uh, like sort of do my own sensitivity training. And uh, I'm a work in progress there, um, as we all are. So thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, do you mind putting the books oh, yes, in the I'll chat? Oh, yes, put them in the chat, yep. Thank you, really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've lost my cue for a moment. Let's go uh, Pete, Judy, Kevin. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, all. Um, uh, thank you so much for the conversation about mm -hmm. um, male and female energy. Um, thanks, especially Wendy and, and Ken for kicking it off. Um, that was really nice. Um, uh, I have a, like one particular thing to share, um, two particular things kind of, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I'd love it if you would check out the first link there and chat, um, the bi-weekly Plex Dispatch, uh, it's a bi-weekly thing that carries kind of the news of, of the world, uh, send me email for, uh, updates for the next one. Tell me, you know, oh, this is going on in my world. I'd love to hear about it and, and something that relates to the rest of us. Um, not something that is just you. 
Um, the, the big thing for me um, right now is uh, Mattermost uh, is getting an upgrade. Uh, it's been a while since uh, I've upgraded the server software um, and uh, um, I'm super excited we're going to upgrade and, and get rid of a, at least one annoying message that pops up for folks on the phone. Um, uh, there's a couple gotchas, um, and I, I apologize for these kind of up front. Uh, one of them is as a consequence of the server software being upgraded. You don't have to do anything, kind of. Um, but uh, I think sometime this weekend, I'll upgrade the software, and uh, it's going to forget that you have a password. Um, so you're going to have to go to the website and click the I forgot my password, uh, which I know is a lie. You're telling the computer I forgot the password when, in fact, it forgot the password. So I apologize for having to lie to a computer. Computers aren't very smart. Um, anyway, uh, if everything goes well, um, you'll get it, a link to reset your password. You'll be able to reset your password. The other oddball thing is it's going to forget all the attachments. Um, uh, I'll be able to save the attachments we've had. Uh, attachments are when you drag and drop or, or maybe click a button and say, I, I want to share a picture with this one or I want to share um, a file, um, a chat, chat file or something like that. Um, it's going to forget all of those. Uh, I will have saved them. Um, they're not easy to reconnect back to the messages that they came from. The thing that I can do is tell who the, the attachments came from. And with that, I can help you find an attachment that you know got lost. Um, I wish I could put them all in a big bucket and we could just look through them all. Um, it turns out that it's going to save all the attachments from everything, including direct messages. Uh, so it would be an invasion of privacy, potentially, um, to just have a big bucket of all the attachments. So that's not a practical thing anyway. Um, uh, so that does um, sound very, it does sound very zen, as Ken just posted in the chat. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, I think you're doing the world a zen favor piece. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, uh, yeah, an earlier rev, uh, earlier rev of this was, let's just forget all the messages even. Let's not even remember what we've talked about. Not even have channels. Let's just start all over again. I think it's better to, to keep a little bit of context. Um, so thanks, everybody, for continuing to use Mattermost. Um, I, I know it can be a pain sometimes, and I apologize for the pain. And, and, uh, but I think it's a useful thing. It's a, it's a nice place to come and chat with us all. So um, bear with us through this uh, little upgrade process. And uh, if you have problems, send me an email uh, or send mail to support it at uh, collectivesensecommons.org, uh, which goes to me. Um, and also, there's a, a web page to watch. Uh, back in the chat, uh, you can always go to status.collectivesensecommons.org and see you know, what's currently going on. That website is set up so it never goes down, um, almost never. Um, uh, and so you can always check there, like, why can't, you know, my, my phone isn't connecting to, to uh, Mattermost, darn thing. Um, so after throwing it away and then refining your phone and, and cursing it at Pete or computers or whatever, um, you can hit that website and at least see what's going on. Uh, and don't feel, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, and thank you for all the great stuff and the, the community updates and the wallpaper and everything else. Um, Judy, Kevin, Bill. I'll pass for now, Jerry, thanks. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Kevin. I know you've got the floor faster than you thought. Here we go. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, in terms of like, what do you do now? Uh, we're a meeting with a group. We're going to start to see if the donut economics model could work in our part of the county uh, at one o'clock uh, Eastern. And I think it's, it's pretty interesting that folks I'm inviting of, you know, one guy kind of leads our um, People who care about Swannanoa, a Democrat group. One <clears throat> was a UN peace guy globally, and the other is a, a, a sensible Baptist pastor, which is sort of this subset. Uh, <laughs> we're going to see if, where we can go from there. And I think it's kind of interesting. I've been researching again how these people use that uh, in the UK and in Brazil. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and I guess the second is I'm working with. Uh, 
Jordan and to see if his marketplace can work with this thing uh, called smallstreet.org, which will be a aggregation of, of crowdfunding in our locality uh, here in Buncombe County uh, that Michael Schumann created along with this uh, donor advised fund. So a place where you can uh, give, uh, use catalytic uh, venture philanthropy and invest in local crowdfunding. I think it, it could be pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, so, but I, I'm, I yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm encouraged by all the places around where the donut is, is being used, where people figure out what to do locally and uh, repeatedly and not be afraid. I mean, I think, you know, a, avoiding panic and fear you can do it through collective action with a pretty interesting frame and the donut seems uh, pretty useful. I've been going down into their tools. They have four lenses, uh, social and ecological, local and global, and you, you apply it and then you, you, you take it down and you do a portrait. And so, uh, you know, I, I really have no time for anybody who's, who's wasting their energy in despair. I think that's just, uh, it, it, it is a collective suck on, on the consciousness of all of us. And, and I think, it, time to get over despair was like you know, a few days ago. So that's all. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Wendy Gill Stewart. I'll pass to you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Gill Stewart. What do you mean about turns coming up faster than one expects? I know, it's crazy. Yeah, I'm just trying to find a Toni Morrison quote that speaks right to what Kevin said. Um, so we'll have to post later. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I really appreciate the conversation we've been having this morning. And thank you for folks who've instigated that. Um, it provokes a lot of questions for me. I think we might be a little too a little too ready to pin the tail on Western men, because it seems to me this is a much older phenomenon and much more pervasively human phenomenon. I'm not an anthropologist, but I remember reading stuff, uh, looking at societies where the work of women and the work of men are sometimes reversed, but the work of women is always somehow regarded less. So there's some other kind of monkey business going on, perhaps. Um, besides Western men. I say that not to duck any blame, but to say it's maybe a harder problem for us to solve um, than some modern people being more aware. Because we are, each of us, you know, I mean, I'm influenced not just by you all, but the world I've grown up in and my parents and the world that they grew up in and the media soup that I'm immersed in. And it's, you know, it's a mess of how we form what we think and believe and say and how we react. Um, Thank you. That's exactly the one, Pete. In the chat, there's no. This is no. There is no time. I'll say this is no time for despair. No place for self pity. No need for silence. No room for fear. We speak. We write. We do language. That is how civilizations heal. So, Kevin, that's my little refuge this morning from what you said. And Eric, look what you said. Um, my mood this last week has not been so much terror, although there's some of that with, with the nuclear saber rattling, but I, I woke up in a mood of grief several days, and it's a very uncharacteristic place for me. Uh, I tend to be much more optimistic, uh, more focused on the glass half full, and it's, it's not despair, Kevin. It's not, like, you know, it's, not, it's not grief like hopelessness, but it's grief like a profound, deep sadness that this is where we are now. Um, that we're still stuck uh, in, in, in these stories. Um, so that um, one other thing from earlier on, there was discussion of the purpose of these conversations versus emergent conversations. I'm here for the emergence. I'm in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things like this these days for emergence. And it's not that there's not work to be done uh, and things to be done. And that's, um, um, uh, but the richness of this kind of open-ended exploration is very rare. And, um, you know, the gender dynamics are part of the constraint on this, uh, but it's also a challenge of having, what do we got, you know, 10, 15, 20 people in a conversation together, weaving in and out. I think, I think we're pretty good at it compared to most things I've seen. And Jerry, you know, big nod to you for your ladle and your spoon. 
Uh, but this, this ain't an easy thing to do, to have a lot of voices mix up in, you know, in a way that, it, that feels good and inclusive and rewarding. So um, for me, this is a very important experiment and it influences me uh, in other conversations that I have in my life. So I'm grateful to all of you for that. Um, the, the quick check-in is, I get, and I guess one of the reasons that I'm comfortable with con emergence conversations is that I'm very focused in my day-to-day -day life. I'm really barreling in on, um, you know, sort of taking the, the, the 20 projects I might like to do and I'm taking it down to really, you know, two or three. I'm doing so, some individual coaching, uh, which I'm calling trim tab for trim tabs uh, as, a, as a cash flow uh, engine for me while I'm focusing on um, standing up a company, a, 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 a turnaround fund to produce ecologically grounded, employee-owned, community-rooted companies. Uh, and so we're in very early stages of that. I've talked with <clears throat> Kevin about it at length, um, uh, just starting to go out to investors this last week. And one really intriguing piece of feedback I've got from a number of folks who've been in the, in, in the workplace democracy realm before was their experience of how reluctant people are to want to have control. Um, people would rather have either a paycheck or maybe they'd rather have profit sharing, but to be in charge of the enterprise, maybe not. So that's going to be an interesting thing to discover of, you know, is that so? Is that, that these, this, these reports are 20, 30 years old. Is it true today? Where is it true? Why is there, is there something to nurture there? Um, are, are humans, do humans really want democracy or are they reluctant for democracy? Do they know how to do democracy? And democracy at the scale of, you know, 10 or 50 or 200 people is arguably different than the scale of 20 million or 200 million. Um, but I'm, I'm realizing what a fascinating experiment we're walking into with that part of the story. So um, that's it for the moment. Thank you, Gil. Oh, yeah, just one other thing one other thing about, um, about men and leadership. I saw a quote from um, everybody's hero of the moment, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, who specifically instructed that he did not want his portrait hung in government offices all over Ukraine when he was elected, which was the way things were done. And he said, this ain't about me. I work for you. And no pictures. I think it's ironic that uh, an actor comedian who was playing president on a, sort of a soap on TV becomes president and turns out to be uh, better than his character. It turns out to be better than most other presidents. Yeah, at least from, from all the participation and all we're seeing in, in this role, it's incredible. My favorite line was, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. There's that too, yeah. He, he was also a... Um, um, a lawyer and an accomplished television executive. So uh -huh. and comedy, comedy and acting was just something that he happened to do <laughs> also. Mm -hmm. Well, probably helped him as an executive. <laughs> Love that. Um, we have Stacy Doug Michael. Well, a lot here today. <laughs> um, so the, pa the past few days motivated by my desire to you know, shift the way we think. Um, I've spent a lot of time on, not a lot of time, but the time I've spent on Facebook regarding the um, crisis with Ukraine has really been about, the, like Wendy put in a really beautiful quote, <laughs> which sort of speaks to it. And um, the point I'm trying to make is, so the stuff I was putting on had more to do with people standing up and saying no war. And I put stuff about Russian citizens standing up. And I happened to have one Russian friend from Miami who is an acquaintance and she came on pro-Putin, what's wrong with you people, blah, blah, blah. I won't go through the whole few days. It was very time consuming, but I answered her very politely on the page. And then we went into a private dialogue. The reason I'm bringing it up is Again, it was very tiresome, but I really thought it was important, mainly because she has this whole Russian community. And, you know, we, we started off talking about propaganda and there was a lot of agreement. 
but I want to get to the end of the story, which I think is a little uplifting. I can say she's totally changed her mind, although she is looking at things differently, but two important things came out. One is that she moved to the page of, I'm just praying for peace. I want this to be over. And more importantly, when she realized she wasn't going to win the fact war, <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. But she came out with, what I'm really concerned about is the planet and what I'm going to leave to my children. And at that point, I was able to send her some of the information that I get from here and change the whole dialogue. So it is worth it sometimes. <laughs> and I just wanted to share that. So I'm not feeling, I just want to add, I'm not really feeling the same sense of grief. I'm feeling that things are coming to the surface that people's emotions are coming to the surface. I'm feeling it's a, it's a place for healing to begin. Um, and I'm gonna stick on those front lines. I'm complete. I love that. Stacy. thanks for what you're doing. Um, Gild and Stuart. Yeah, Stacy. to be clear, the grief does not mean an absence of hope. These are coexisting, but, um, but there's a pain that I'm feeling that I haven't been present to before. So there's that. Um, I love what you said about your conversation with this woman, because I think a lot about how change happens. And I'm, I'm, I'm living in the hypothesis that one of the ways it happens is when people talk about what they really care about. And behind you know, our political differences and ideological differences and gender differences and all that stuff, there's a lot of stuff that we care about in common. And that seems to be one of the critical doorways to having something happen. So thank you for, for modeling that. There was a fascinating post um, this last week and it's somewhere in my stream. I'll see if I can dig it up and share. Um, uh, about clients, a climate scientist um, who's, got, who's on, on TikTok has 300,000 followers on TikTok and was sharing what she observed about the conversations there. Well, <clears throat> you know, excuse me. Well, uh, mostly, you know, obviously involving people much younger than herself and much younger than us. Um, and she said, um, the fact war is not it. The fact war is not the war you're going to win. Uh, what was persuasive that she saw uh, was people seeing something attractive that they wanted to do or have or be like. So the mod modeling the change rather than trying to convince somebody of the change was the, was the takeaway uh, from her work. So something for us to think about. I, th I think this is a broad generalization, but I think the reason a lot of people are in distress around the world is that they see a grimmer future for their children than they had and that their grandparents had. And they, they, that's horrible. That's like no, no person really wants that. And you go into the streets for that. You do whatever you can for that. And if you're being spun, then you act on the spin for that. But I think that's a common, common motivation. And it takes us back a little bit to what Stacey just said. Uh, Stuart. What Stacy said, um, it's critical in trying to resolve conflict that you chunk up to get to a place that everybody can agree to. That's you know, kind of one of the things that's outraged me about what's going on. You've got, a pan you've, you've got a pandemic and you've got climate catastrophe and you've got Putin creating mayhem in the world. Uh, you know, and hopefully that will be our salvation when people wake up to exactly what Stacy just said. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Doug, Michael, Julian, and Grace, whenever she lands. I'm almost going to pass, but not quite. Uh, I want to say something about why I would pass. And that is, I find that there's no language right now in me that fits in how I feel. Mm. Uh, and I think that we are all uh, kind of powerless. And the answer to the despair for me is to just think hard, have conversations, study history, and try and understand what's going on. And at the same time, try and take care of anybody you know of who's hurt. Mm. Anyway, I'm gonna stop right there. Mm. Thank you, that's, that's lovely. Um, Michael, then Julian, then Grace. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'll uh, I'll just share something that I was was discussing with um, Wendy. Um, 
in direct messages um, about, you know, I, I really resonated with her um, making the distinction between the way men and women behave and male and female energy in all of us and how um, the, the urge to compete, the urge to win um, is, is really constantly stoked in men, even, even in groups like this, I feel like there's a, there's a competitive aspect to the way that, um, you know, men lay out what they're doing, what they think, what their analysis is. Um, and it's hard not to play. And it's not, it's not just, it's not just men among men. I mean, I find with my, you know, with my partner, you know, there, there are things that when, when I express my feminine self, it's unwelcome and off-putting. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that Grace said, you know, hey, you know, lobbing those projectiles is attractive sometimes. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's a thing where women and men have this idea of what it's like to be manly. Um, and uh, it's hard not to play. Um, and, and, you know, sharing as winning, as opposed to, you know, the, the, the metaphor of, of kids playing a game and uh, was, was brought up, I think uh, Grace brought that up too. Um, and I remember a conversation that, that I've thought of often that, that Pete and I had somewhere uh, about, um, you know, sports metaphors, men always going after winning. Um, and, and, and Pete said, you know, collaboration wins in the meta bracket. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that, is I, I hope that's true, um, but you know it hasn't yet in a way, um, and I think that's that's what we're about here is figuring out how we can create a place where collaboration can be the winner, where we all can be the winner, where you know somebody isn't isn't the leader. Um, you know, it's it's leading isn't for everybody. Um, and, and, and frankly, I feel like it's not for me. Um, I wanna collaborate and cooperate and support and I want that to be success. And it's hard to do that in a competitive capitalist world. Um, I also wanted to say something about, about despair and, and feeling um, and I, I was, well, I understood it. I was was hit a little bit by um, what what Kevin said, and you know, and Gil shared the the Tony Mar Morrison um, quote about, and you know, I, I I felt for Bill and what he was saying, um, and you know. I think feeling your feelings is something that you can do alongside, um, you know, taking action or maybe sometimes in lieu of taking action and reflecting and sharing your feelings and, and, and uh, you know, perspectives with people who will know how to lead the action in response to the thing that you're having an emotional response to. And that, seems like it can be a female energy, male energy um, question. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that that was that was pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, and and thanks to everybody for um, for um, making this the subject. Same here. Thank you. 
Um, Grace and Julian, uh, and and I totally missed whether Mark uh, got a turn. I'm uh, and if I missed anybody else, please raise your hand. But um, Grace, do you want to go and then Julian? Yeah. Um, gosh, there's so much in this conversation today. I kind of want to, I don't know, maybe tag along with uh, the last discussion about about leadership and and also what what you said, Jerry, about it being hard. You know, like it's um, things are going really well. I have a lot of updates. I'd love to update about everything, everybody about. I'm going to move my project forward. You know, but what's there for me is that this constant stress of being the leader, and also, um, I, you know, and I live on my own, and it just feels like, for me. There isn't a place to rest. Mm. I've got a company and a little bit small business that I'm running. I'm creating this kind of these online workshops. I'm creating this new forms of economy stuff. And it's just like, and, and, and I love being a leader, but there's no place to just be like, you know, I had a hard day. You know, I don't have that in my life, like a place to just go and say, I had a hard day. And yeah, so it's hard, right? And, and, and I really resonate a lot with what people were talking about, about the despair and the, this, you know, how, how the world is frightening. I, um, I got permission from my landlady to, to bring in a refugee for my, in, my, in my room here. And it's like such a funny thing to really see how that's related to here in Europe, it, it, you know, in the former Yugoslav Republic, and, and the difference between how the Ukrainian people are being perceived, like, oh, those are, those are like us. Those are people who the Russians are invading, and we better, you know, do something about that. But, you know, people coming up from the South, that's a different you know, story. Mostly those people are, are just trying to, you know, they're not, they're not war uh, refugees, it's just they're looking for a better life. Like, so what? So am I. That's why I live here. But I just happen to be white. And so, and I've got the right degrees and it was easy for me to get residency. And I don't think I'm any less of a refugee than any of those people. I just could see it coming five years before. You know? Um, and Israel is still livable, you know, my home country, but. <laughs> so I don't see the refugees from the Ukraine as different from me, except that they waited a little too long. Um, so that's interesting. I think the other thing, it's interesting, you guys have been bringing up a bunch of different areas where the world is, you know, the, 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 these issues of the world. And what's been interesting to me about this crisis is also, it's, it's going to be about money again, because it's like me and the money thing, is the money war, right? It started with the Canadians and freezing their stuff. And then it's like the first thing against Vladimir, it's like, oh, we're going to take them out of the SWIFT system. We've got all kinds of stuff. And then, oh, Ukrainians are using crypto, right? Okay, send the Ukrainians crypto, everybody's using crypto. And then this week, I don't know, probably a lot of you didn't notice this, but a few weeks ago, NVIDIA said that they wouldn't allow their GPUs to process um, crypto mining. And you gotta wonder, right? That's not a good business decision. You gotta what? wonder who was whispering in their ear that they should say that. Right? Somebody must have put a heck of a lot of pressure on NVIDIA. You can find this in the news. It's not like, yeah, you know, they said they wouldn't allow crypto mining on their GPUs. And this week there's a ransomware attack against them and a release of some firmware. And that by these ransomware attackers that are like, if you've got a G one of these new GPUs, you just install this software or firmware or whatever and it'll work. And it's a war. It's a money war. There's all out money war. And there was a recent, um, recent, recently I heard somebody speaking, speaking on a, on a podcast about this, the idea that the cryptocurrency is, is equivalent to the print, to the printing press, which caused the entire like hundred years war between the Catholic church and the reformation, whatever. And it's the same thing. And the war is being fought on every front. You know, it's like the physical war in the Ukraine and 
in the money wars and the whatever. And it's, it's super, like, I kind of want to be frightened, but I also feel like, but hey, like I've got my little warm apartment and I'm doing just fine. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of like one aspect to check. And the other aspect to check, and I'm not going to talk about my project, but I will say that I've gotten to this point with my, with my stuff where I'm like, I just really want to appreciate Peter and everything he's doing because I'm starting to think about weaving together all these different um, um, tools to create some kind of a platform for the community that's been doing my workshops and I'm getting ready to do the next round of workshops. And, you know, we're looking at the, Pete, I can't, I don't know how you do it, man. Like weaving together the, there's like the Zoom and there's a whatever, and then there's Jerry's brain and then there's the Mattermost and then there's like, and all these pieces. And, and I'm really um, trying to figure out this puzzle of how to put that together in some way where people can come in and be like, okay, here's my portal. Here are the you know things I'm signed up for, like the conversations that I'm signed up for. And here are the things I've already done. And here's the conversation I wanna host. And anyway, um, any ideas on how to set those kinds of things up are welcome. And I guess what I've been working on is thinking about this as a kind of a campus, because I've noticed that people come through my workshops or my discussions like for a few weeks and then they go off back to their communities. And so I'm really feeling like what I wanna create is some kind of a campus where different communities come in and come out and there's events going on and there's open hours and, and it's not a community in and of itself, but kind of a, you know, like a, what, what did you call like the, um, like the community center of the, these different communities where everybody kind of comes around and so. That's my check-in. Grace, thank you. Love that. Um, just in in sort of terms of despair along these issues, one of the things I did was I created a thought called "Silver Linings of Putin's Attack on Ukraine," and uh, uh, you know, might some Republican support for Putin fragment the GQP? Um, uh, there's a great moment to flush the world of Russia's kleptocrats and oligarchs. Um, she might reconsider invading Taiwan or he might just plan better. Um, it might be a geopolitical turning point against autocrats. And I have this, this sort of moment where, uh, and I have to find it here. I didn't connect it to this, but um, I have a thought called Putin's impotence plus Biden's 20. 2022 State of the Union address feels like a good tipping point somehow. Uh, and there was an article by Ann Applebaum called The Impossible Suddenly Became Possible that was uh, pretty interesting in that sense. Um, so with that, uh, Julian, you get to like summarize everything and encapsulate it all in like a crystalline prosaic Expression. Maybe it will, because I had a minimal check-in, but I wanted something that Doug said a few minutes ago about study history reminded me of one of my favorite quotes by George Santayana about those who do not study history are condemned to repeat it. Um, at least, the, and then on the note of uh, optimism you just introduced a few seconds ago, so far it looks like we're not going to repeat the Munich appeasement. So. There we are. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all. This has been a great conversation. I love where we go. I love how we go. Um, plenty to think about from this. About men and women, about grief, about the moment, all of that. So see you on the, um, on the inner tubes. Let's be careful out there. Thanks. Ciao.